In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, Jesus gives Peter a miraculous catch of fish and then says, from now on, you will be catching people. This comment has turned into a very unhelpful Christian catchphrase that we will all be fishers of men. I'm going to talk about why I believe this was just intended to be a promise for Peter, what can go wrong when we turn this into a goal for all Christians, and what gets overlooked when we do this. Let's start by reading today's scripture, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken, And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. I first heard this story as a child in Sunday school. It's one I heard a lot when I was young, probably because it's easy to depict in pictures, and it was also turned into a catchy children's song. But even if your history with this text goes all the way back to childhood, we need to remember that it's a side comment that Jesus made to one guy. Now, I can hear someone saying out there, but Melissa, don't you believe we're supposed to spread the good news? That's all this means. How can you say this isn't for everyone? I can't speak for what every Christian everywhere is gifted in or what they're supposed to do. The clear mandate that Jesus taught all his disciples at the Last Supper was that they were to love each other, even serve each other. But regardless of what we are all supposed to do, this comment was directed to one man as he was being invited to follow Jesus. And when we reduce it to a rule that we all need to follow, we miss the depth of the promise that this statement represented in Peter's life and ministry. Let's look at the overarching story here. Peter was a skilled fisherman. When Jesus asked him for a lift in his boat so that he could talk to the crowds of people, Peter had already been working all night. He was tired. He was cleaning his nets. His work on that day had been unsuccessful, but he takes Jesus out onto the lake so that Jesus can speak to the crowds. After Jesus had talked to the people, he told Peter to let the fishing nets down again. He's asking Peter to fish again. This is the last thing anyone would want to hear. It's the end of his work day. The nets had already been cleaned. Jesus isn't even a fisherman and doesn't know what he's talking about. After daybreak isn't even the best time to fish. It probably seemed a little bit insulting or even ridiculous. Peter explains a little bit of fishing 101, but then humbly does what Jesus asks. And when he did, he's overwhelmed by the catch of fish. It's in this context that Jesus tells Peter that from now on, Peter will catch people. This was the day that Jesus called Peter as his disciple, and it was a clever way to say, follow me. And fast forward to the early church right after the ascension. The followers of Jesus gather and pray, waiting for instructions, waiting for the Holy Spirit. Suddenly the Holy Spirit rushes into their midst and they are inspired to go rushing outdoors. Peter, after having a track record of saying everything wrong, is filled with the Spirit and preaches to a crowd, telling them everything Jesus had done. 4,000 people believe in that moment, even though many of them don't even speak the same language. This miracle on the day of Pentecost is a mirror image of the overwhelming catch of fish. Peter's best efforts were not good enough. He failed completely. Then Jesus said to him, put down the nets again, or feed my sheep. As Peter humbly responds to that call, listening to Jesus, listening to the Holy Spirit, responding to what God is doing in that moment, allowing himself to be a part of God's work, he sees the results of following those instructions on the day of Pentecost. God's results, God's moving in the hearts and minds of the people present. I see two problems with turning this comment that was meant for Peter into a goal for all Christians. One problem is that it can create a temptation to trick people into attending church with a clickbait type of event. 
events that sound like a party or free food, a carnival, but really they end up requiring people to sit through a message before they can access the event. I think this happens in part because of the way we fish today as compared to the way they fished back then. When I've fished, I've either used a lure, which looks like a bug or a smaller fish, or I've used something a fish would identify as food to cover up a hook on which that food is attached. Modern fishing uses bait to snag a fish against its will to get it into our cooler. And when we grow up hearing that we should be fishers of people, this foundational understanding of what fishing is affects how we understand that objective. In Peter's day, fishing involved going to where the fish were and lowering a net, and the idea was to pull the nets up when a school was passing over them. And the end result was the same, fish in a cooler, but rather than trickery, it involved paying attention to the fish, going there and waiting. And that's still not how I want to interact with people, and I'm glad that coercing people into attending a church isn't exactly the point of this text. But the second problem arises from trying to take a shortcut around discerning what our gifts in ministry might be. When Peter trusted and followed the calling Jesus gave him, a very large crowd listened to him and believed on the day of Pentecost. This was work of God through Peter. When we take a promise given to Peter and make it a goal of our Christian life, it turns ministry into a numbers game, elevating preachers who can bring in the crowds. Preachers who are charismatic and charming are assumed to be mature because they naturally draw a crowd. We equate a large following as being a work of God. Therefore, anyone who can draw a large crowd is assumed to be following God's will and acting in line with the Holy Spirit. This is a shortcut in our logic that has been very harmful. There are people who can just draw a crowd through their energetic charm. And some of these people are following God, but they're immature and rise to power too quickly because of their skill. They're given too much power too soon, and some have abused that power. And there are others who aren't even trying to follow God. They're trying to build a following. These people count on the lack of critical thinking as part of their grift. This message isn't about a specific person or ministry. It's a call to evaluate how a misread of this text has caused us to take shortcuts that we can't afford to take. Well-spoken people aren't always trustworthy. This need to look at motives is timeless. We need to evaluate people by the fruit in their life. On the other hand, if a person can't fill stadiums, that doesn't mean they're not called to pastoral ministry. Peter's track record would have disqualified him in the eyes of many pastoral search teams. Let's look at what I'll call Peter's pastoral internship to see how following Jesus played out for him. Many of Peter's comments and actions are misguided and receive anything from a gentle to a sharp rebuke from Jesus. Peter was experienced in fishing, but in his new role as a disciple of Jesus, he's talking to people, praying for people, answering trick questions, witnessing miracles, not understanding the cryptic things Jesus is saying. At one point, he wants to save Jesus from execution, as any follower would. Jesus responds by saying, get behind me, Satan. During the arrest of Jesus, Peter cuts off a soldier's ear, and again he's corrected. And later that night, Peter denies even knowing Jesus. I mean, either there isn't a single person in all of history who would have looked competent standing next to Jesus, or Peter is really out of his element in a new calling. And preachers everywhere have a field day with Peter. He becomes the bumbling sitcom sidekick, the comic relief of many sermons. But the thing is, it's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback. Hindsight is 2020. Peter doesn't suddenly get it after the resurrection either. In one gospel, he doesn't believe Mary's account. In another gospel, he went back to fishing for a living. He had lost whatever faith in his ministry that he had had. And then he re-encounters the resurrected Jesus, who hangs out for a few weeks teaching the disciples before returning to heaven. He's recommissioned into his ministry, and I've already described the results of that. The good news of this message is that we don't have to recycle Peter's promise for ourselves. We don't have to shoehorn ourselves into his shoes if they don't fit. God wants a relationship with you, the you that you are. Your work or role in the lives of people around you will be different than Peter's. Inspiring people to convert to Christianity isn't something that everyone can do or should try to do. People have different gifts and different callings. Some people may be gifted in explaining what they believe to others in a way that inspires belief. Some people have gifts around prayer or mercy. The gifts people have and how they can work together within community is a big topic that could be its own study. 
When we stop taking shortcuts, we stop taking snippets from the Bible and just trying to paste them onto our lives, we can listen and grow to understand our role in our Christian life. But discovering our role or our gifts isn't quick or formulaic. It takes time to listen in prayer, to listen to what we hear when we read the Bible, and to listen to the wisdom of trusted friends and leaders within our Christian community. This work is done over time. Pray about your joys and your disappointments. Your work may not look as impressive as Peter's Day of Pentecost sermon, but it may be just what's needed for you and for the others that are around you. The invitation is to stay in communication with God through it all. We aren't all fishermen, and the kingdom of heaven isn't simply a large catch of fish. The kingdom of heaven is also compared to a costly pearl, a field of crops, a wedding banquet, finding lost sheep and welcoming back lost children as we minister using our gifts. Let us bring the comfort of a family, the protection of a shepherd, the attentiveness of a person looking for a lost treasure back to our understanding of what it means to be a church and leave the fishing to email scanners. Thanks for watching.